If you identify and dress and behave and whatever as a trans woman and you end up in a male prison, you would be more, more at more danger. There's no question about that. I think most of them are autogynophiles, right? So I think it's a sexual fetish. I don't think that makes someone vulnerable. It's not true what you said, which is these people just want to be validated as women. There are trans people, many of them we've had on the show, who, who don't want that. They just want to live their life. I don't think that's true, Constantine. If you if you have fake breasts and long hair and call yourself by a, by a female name, do you think they don't want to be seen as women? Uh, I think they, they do, but that doesn't mean they're willing to invade your space. They will literally slice the breasts of a 13-year-old girl. They will do it. There's nullification surgery. The, the, sorry, clarify, what, what is that, Posey? What, nullification surgery? Yeah. From the chin down, you get rid of your nipples, you get rid of your belly button, you get rid of any external genitalia, like male or female, and you just have it smoothed except for your pipe work. Like, they literally will, will dehumanise your torso. I was, I was even going to go to Portland, which we had to cancel because there were credible death threats. Wow. Um, do, you, do you know who from or what yeah. organisations? Which well, it was all Antifa. There's a man who's actually a famous model with his top down, with his fake breasts, shaking them at women, shouting, saying, these hands don't discriminate. I will F you up. I ain't dancing to anybody's tune. I, I, I just won't do it. Hey Francis, do you like entrepreneurs? Not really. What do you mean? What do you think we do at trigonometry? Annoy people on the internet, cause meltdowns on Twitter, and destroy people with logic and facts. Right, stop stealing my catchphrases. It's facts and logic. I'm just saying, being an entrepreneur is against my culture. Why would I work hard when I could just lie on the beach in a sombrero shouting, ay, ay, ay? Well, for those of you who aren't Venezuelan, you need to check out Rob Moore, the disruptive entrepreneur. Rob Moore has been an entrepreneur for 16 years. He's built seven companies, written 18 business and investing books, and now he helps creators, startups, scale-ups, and anyone wanting to build assets, income, and freedom through information, education, and inspiration. Rob has reached millions of people to be disruptive entrepreneurs, and turn their passion into their profession. As well as instant access to Rob's number one ranked Disruptors podcast with the world's most disruptive guests and billionaires, he's also giving away a digital financial toolkit to help you save half your salary and costs in a year. Plus, keynote talks on building digital assets and multiple income streams digitally. Go now to bit.ly slash Rob Toolkit but be quick, because this isn't usually free. It's all at bit.ly slash Rob Toolkit, and you will then be directed to the Disruptors podcast. Plus, all this great info will help you destroy people with logic and facts. Yay, yay, yay. I give up. Hello, and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Well, doesn't get any more fascinating than the guest we have returning for you today for the third time. She holds the record for our most viewed interview ever. Kelly J. Keen, welcome back to Trigonometry. Oh, thank you so very much. Uh, it's good to have you back. As you can see, we're building our new studio at the moment and you've been traveling in the US. We haven't really had a chance to pay too much attention to what's been going on. Unbe yeah, unbelievable from us. Um, how are you? I'm really good. Yeah, really, really good. Bit so what, what mischief have you got up to in the US then? So I decided to do a tour um, and it started in LA, went up to San Francisco, um, Seattle, Chicago, Austin, and then East Coast. And it was called Let Women Speak. And it really is just creating a space in which women feel that they can speak about what's happening in America, which is insane. That doesn't sound controversial at all, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I knew I had to do it because it's the belly of the beast, right? Um, so I was, I was even going to go to Portland, which we had to cancel because there were credible death threats. 
Wow. Um, do, you, some... do you know who from or what yeah. organisations? Which well, it was all it? Antifa. Okay. But this particular guy was uh, raising money to uh, <laughs> buy some weapons. Um, yeah, and we, I mean, at other parts of our events, we had people that you could see had reinforced um, gloves on. Um, a, a long story, like a woman got her fingers crushed and broken. Uh, they, in, it was just, yeah, anyway, it's going back to the story. Um, it's, it's about the numerous women, and we're making a documentary, so the idea is to record the dissent because the most known documentary against this stuff is by a man who I'm grateful that he's done it, but it is embedded in part of his other kind of agenda. Um, and I want this to be a women's story because it's our language that's being erased, it's our bodies. Mm. And I know the children is a, a huge issue, but um, I don't want another episode in human history to pass us by when it's the story of women. No, you're an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you. Uh, but, uh, but tell us more about it. So for people joining us who, who are less familiar with you than we are, you're a woman's rights campaigner. We had you on the show, I think, back in 2019 or 2020, probably 2019, mm -hmm. uh, when you, you sort of very articulately talked us out of some of the, let's say, sort of inherited views that many people have about the issue of transgender rights and the conflict between that and women's rights and the safety of children. Hmm. So you go to America to, to give, to talk basically yes. about this issue. Yes. And what happens? Um, so it's a, it's a jump off from uh, the speaker's corners, uh, speaker corner events I do every month, the last end of every month. And we started to do them around the UK and America's massive. So what happens is, I say I'm going to be somewhere, I work with an organising team, local organising team of women. Um, they get permits if they need them. Sometimes we just do guerrilla talks, which means we just turn up and hope we don't get moved. Uh, and women who feel that they can come out do come out. Um, it's not huge in number. Uh, but then um, I've got my documentary guy with me um, and you're just given the microphone and you talk. Mm -hmm. There is no political affiliation. Uh, there's nothing that you can't say besides what is there, whatever is illegal in the location that you're at. So, you know, that brings with it certain other risks. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really is genuine free speech, tested genuine free speech. And we don't seem to have that tradition as much in this country, do we? No, although Speaker's Corner's good, but now it's just populated by people talking about God of mm. different varieties. So we do... I did it because I recognised that women in the modern public square, which is social media, were censored all the time. We just can't talk. Um, I'm sure I've mentioned it before. I'm banned from Mumsnet, Twitter. I can't advertise on Facebook. I can't advertise on Instagram. My Posey Parker account got banned from Facebook. My Eventbrite... Events have been taken off because they're hateful. I can't sign a change.org uh, petition. You know, I'm, I'm censored from everywhere. So we <laughs> Kelly, if I am a random person watching this conversation, I haven't come across you before, I maybe haven't come across trigonometry before. What are these hateful things that you're saying exactly? That women don't have penises, uh, that men don't have vaginas, no man gives birth, um, that women's anatomy is to be named properly. Um, and I don't want euphemisms. I don't want, we're not menstruators, we're women. Um, it's protecting the language around women um, and not using any of that language for men. So there's no such thing as a trans woman, there's just a man. <laughs> um, there's no such thing as non binary, it's just a very special person. <laughs> um, and so it, it's that sort of stuff. It's saying that we shouldn't transition children. So everything that's, Every part of our language and narrative that's being co-opted by this transgender ideology is something that I want to take back. I see. And remember when we did our first mm -hmm. ever interview, one of the, we had a lot of back and forth. Uh, and I think it's fair to say both Francis and I have come much closer to your position since then, which is to your credit. But also the one issue that I still feel that every time you talk about it is what, is it not, <laughs> look, 
It's a conflict between the rights of different groups. Is that what's going on here? Right? Yeah. You're not comfortable saying mm -hmm. it like that? Well, it... Yeah, let's leave it. Yes. Okay. For the, for the purpose of... Yeah. Why, why, why the hesitation around that? Kelly? Well, because I feel it's... A conflict it sort of imagines that there are two positions of equal value. No, not necessarily equal no? value, but okay. just two different positions. Right, and there do. are some people who hold this position and some people hold this position. Yes. And this group has certain rights that it wants to have, and this group has certain rights that it wants to have, and they're in conflict with each other. So to make it very simple, if I am a trans man, trans woman, right, used to be a man, transitioned, and I want to go into a women's toilet, there are women in there who may not want me in there, right? That's the conflict, Yeah. right? But what I never understood about your position, I still don't understand is, would it not just be a lot easier to say a trans woman is not a woman, which I agree with, but why do we have to be so insistent that they're men as opposed to just going, it's a trans woman? And it's a different category, and we can talk about what rights they have and don't have. Make, <laughs> can we not make that accommodation? Let me walk you down this very <laughs> friendly path. So, when you use female language for men, even when you put trans woman in front of it, you put that man as a category of woman. And he loses the identifiable kind of everything that comes with being a man, right? And so, that's why we're here having this discussion in the first place. That's why I just got stopped at the train station by someone talking about her trans women friends. Mm. It's because we've confused people by pretending that they're not men and that they are something else. Well, then they're, <laughs> they're categorically men. Um, for everything that's important and essential, whether it's uh, their mortality, um, whether it's uh, their DNA, whether it's their behavior, their propensity to commit crime, um, the way they make women feel, they are men. That's why. And, and what would you say to those people who are saying that this category are vulnerable, this trans women category that are vulnerable, therefore there needs to be some kind of special dispensation? You know, it doesn't, you know, maybe not entering women's spaces, which is, I agree with you on that, but also as well, can we really treat them as men and put them in, so for instance, a male prison? Isn't that dangerous for them? See, now we get to a point where I think I don't know if I care too much and I don't know if I agree with the argument that they are vulnerable. I think if, you, if you're a man and to go outside of your house, you stick on a dress and a bag wig, I, I just don't see where you're vulnerable. Let's pretend that I think... You, you would be vulnerable in a men, men's prison. But, 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 you would but why would you do it? Do what? But if you have a choice, why would you do it? Well, the argument would be that these people, that's how they feel, right? So they don't have a choice, that's how they are. Well, I'm a woman, I genuinely feel like a woman, and yet I'm wearing trousers and a T-shirt. No, but that's not the argument. The argument is if you, if you identify and dress and behave and whatever as a trans woman and you end up in a male prison, you would be more, more, at more danger. There's no question about that. Would you be more danger, in more danger than maybe an autistic man in a man's prison? Probably, yes. I don't think you would. I, I genuinely don't think you would. I think there's many vulnerable people in male prison populations. Well, that I agree with, yeah. Um, which is why the suicide rate is so high um, and the rates of violence is so high. And I don't think that those men are any more vulnerable or in need of uh, consideration and certainly not putting them into a women's prison. There is, there is not a point at which... I wasn't suggesting that. No, no. neither was I. No. Okay. The argument then, but you mentioned um, women's prisons or not putting them in male prisons, is that yeah, right? Well, yeah, but I didn't, say, I, I didn't say put them in women's prisons. Okay, my, sorry. My, so my argument, and I think it's Constantine's as well, is that this is a very small subcategory of people who maybe they shouldn't have access to female spaces, but maybe they need their own spaces, if you see what I mean. Yeah. That's where I would come as it from. And okay. so you say that, for instance, there are some people who just put on a wig and a badly fitting dress, but there's also men who take, you know, uh, who have transitioned surgically. They've taken hormones. They're not 
Are they completely men? Yes. <laughs> if I if I bring my cat in now and I cut all her legs off and her ears and her tail, she's still a cat. I agree biologically. But, but she'd probably be more vulnerable, though. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree <laughs> with that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a fair well, point. Well, if I try to throw her out of a small window, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, let's do, let's do, let's go along with your idea that these men are vulnerable. I would I, I really don't know if I agree. And let's say that I think most of them are autogynophiles, right? So I think it's a sexual fetish. I don't think that makes someone vulnerable. But even if I even if I d decided that some of them had gender dysphoria, whatever that might be, um, do I think we should campaign? Well, I certainly won't waste any time doing it. But do I think there should be campaigns? Um, that offer a solution beyond chuck them in with women and let them use women's spaces. Absolutely. Is that what any of them want? Definitely not. What they want is to be validated as women. So part of their whole kind of, I need these, these the rights that I need is to force everybody else to lie and see myself as I see myself. But Kelly, you're talking in generalizations there. I mean, Debbie Hayton, who we've had on the show, mm. who is a trans woman, yes. she made the point that you're making actually, which is I shouldn't be in a women's space because women would be uncomfortable with me there. What mm. the government needs to do is maybe in this very specific instance, provide some kind of special facility where people like me can go because I'd be scary to women in a women's prison, and I probably would be quite vulnerable in a male's mm. prison, right? And do, you know how much I like you, mm -hmm. don't you? But I think this is where sometimes people think, and we've talked about this off camera, people think you're angry when I don't think you are, or hateful when I actually don't think you are. But when you say, well, I, I won't waste any time, or I don't care about these people, or, or whatever, and you talk in these quite broad brushstrokes, mm -hmm. and you put a lot of people into the same category, and actually, just like in any other group of people, whether it's women or men or trans or whatever, there are people who see things differently, mm -hmm. right? So do you, I'm just urging you to have a little bit more nuance, if you will. Okay, so Debbie Hayton, that you um, happily mentioned, has written about him being an autogynophile. So he's... He's written that. He also write gu wrote guidance that put boys into girls' spaces in schools. So, um, and you can find it. I was no, but but let's talk about the argument rather than uh, attacking the person. So my argument is not everybody wants to. Not everybody who's trans is desperate to get into a woman's prison. I mean, most people aren't desperate to get into any prison. Right. So. It's not true what you said, which is these people just want to be validated as women. There are trans people, many of them we've had on the show, who, who don't want that. They just want to live their life. I don't think that's true, Constantine. If, you're, if you have fake breasts and long hair and call yourself by a, by a female name, mm -hmm. do you think they don't want to be seen as women? Uh, I think they, they do, but that doesn't mean they're willing to invade your space in some way. No, but the, the person that you mentioned and probably everybody else you might have had on the show who calls himself a woman who isn't, definitely has used women's spaces, 100%. And so I can, I can bypass some of the maybe happy, soft feeling humanity um, of some of these people because my goal is to just keep them all out of women's spaces. And I don't know if I care about their intentions. I don't think that's any of my business. I don't care if it's nefarious or just jolly or they don't want to invade women's spaces, fine. Five years ago, we weren't talking about this because there wasn't anybody like habitually using women's spaces. I wasn't, it wasn't an issue for me be, before what, 2015? I had no idea that this was happening. But once I'd heard it was happening and getting so much worse and I've just come back from a, country where women were trying to talk. I couldn't even get to my own event. The police would not help me get there safely. I was late to it because there were 60 at least police officers in New York City. There's women penned, caged in, trying to speak. There's an assault live on air where a woman gets her hair pulled by a man calling himself a woman. There's, there's a man who's actually a famous model with his top down, with his fake breasts, shaking them at women, shouting, saying, um, these hands don't um, discriminate, I will F you up to women.
Right. I'm gonna beat your ass. I'm gonna beat your ass. I'm gonna beat your ass. Yes, I will. I will. These hands do not discriminate. These hands do not discriminate. I will fuck you up. I will fuck you up. These titties are more real than you would ever be, bitch. I got body. No man wants you. No man wants you. It's very ladylike behavior, like getting get your tits out and threatening people. I mean, it does sound like Croydon on a Saturday <laughs> night. I have actually seen that. <laughs> it's kind of the MO of many a female. But so I have to focus on those men. Mm -hmm. I can't be thinking, there's, there's no nuance to societal rules when it comes to these specific safeguarding safety things. We've made our minds up. We know that some of you men are lovely, but we don't want you in our space, and we don't care how you feel about that. Um, it's a done deal. I, I mean, when it's put like that, I think that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, I suppose the, the, the circle I'm, or the square I'm trying to circle, the circle I'm trying to square is, whatever we may think about it, the fact is that there are trans people, right? And we're gonna have to reckon with that one way or another. So. I, I perfectly understand the point you make. I'm just wondering if given that that is a reality that we have to deal with, if there's another way, a better way perhaps, to, to rise slightly, to, to look at a slightly bigger picture and go, what would be the constructive way of dealing with this? You know, because you're, I understand, uh, I'm, I, I'm someone myself who feels strongly about certain principles and sticking up for them, as you know, and when you're sticking up for a principle, it's always very natural to be like, this is the way it is, no, no, not one step back, in the words of mm. the great hero Joseph Stalin, right? <laughs> um, but... <sighs> What's my step back that doesn't cost women and girls? I, I'm not saying that there is. I'm, I'm saying it, maybe there is a step up where we just look at it at a bigger picture, like the, the, the third prison suggestion, for example, mm. right? That's a way of recognizing Look, you want to call them men, fine. They want to call themselves trans women, fine. We have a special place where you go if you've committed a crime. Do you know what I mean? And that's a way of not affecting your rights. It's yeah. also a way of not affecting their rights. And everybody is unhappy. <laughs> yeah. That isn't, that isn't what any of these people are looking for. I mean, you know, maybe uh, not the campaigners and the activists and the, the advocates, mm. like the individual. The individual rapist that goes to a prison, maybe, maybe he's looking for a third space. But I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about, especially prisons, we're talking about people in a small environment, um, caged in. In America, we had a woman in um, Hollywood, she called from an, an LA prison, from the inside, um, and talked about what it was like. And these men are in their cells with them. Um, and American prisons are pretty tough anyway. Mm -hmm. You have to do, as, as a woman, if you have to go to court a lot or you're in isolation or whatever, you basically have to do cavity, they have to do cavity searches where there's like 50 women at a time and you have to pull yourself apart and you have to cough and all this stuff. So it's, put a man into that. I mean, that it's degrading, humiliating, vile. And then on top of that, you've got a man who will then rape you as an inmate. And this particular girl thought because she'd annoyed one of the staff, um, that's why she got a man in her cell. That's awful, mm. obviously. So third, third spaces, yeah, if people want to campaign for it and there's money, go for your life. Just not women's spaces. Well, that, that, yeah. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. So, uh, look, uh, one of the things we talked about before, <laughs> <laughs> you're giving me the smile, but we always have this debate. And I think, I think people should, particularly people who like and respect each other, because otherwise it's all kind of, you know, there's the, the TERFs and then there's the TRAs and they're all talking just to themselves and there's no genuine discussion, mm. right? Mm. I think it's important I do to, too. to, to yeah. have this discussion. Hey, Francis, do you like Scottish wildlife? Yeah, I love Glasgow on a Friday night. No, you idiot. I mean Scottish birds and... Oh, you mean Morag? Nah, we're not seeing each other anymore. 
If you do love Scottish natural woodlands and the wildlife, then you have to check out established titles. They're selling one square foot of dedicated land with a unique plot number on a private estate in Edelston in Scotland and an official certificate with a crest. Established titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland whilst helping global reforestation efforts. It's a project based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds. The Scottish call them lairds because they can't spell lords. It's the whiskey. I'm gonna ignore that. They plant a tree with every order and work with global charities, One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. You could officially include the title Lord or Lady on your credit card, plane tickets, dating profiles, etc. It makes a great last minute gift unless you're a socialist and you want the aristocracy abolished. Established Titles is actually running a massive early Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code Trigonometry, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com slash trigonometry to get your gifts now. Go to establishedtitles.com slash trigonometry and get 10% off this wonderful gift. Hello, Stavros? This is Lord Foster of Croydon, mate. Yes, what I want, kebab, salt and pepper, extra, chilli sauce, salt and vinegar on the chips. What do you mean, you shut? I'm a lord. You should always be open for me. One of the things that, uh, when we went to America, one of the things we came away with was the sense that on some issues, the United States is doing a lot better mm. than we are. And I think free speech is genuinely one of them. Like in comedy, for example, mm. the situation is not as bad over there as it is over here in our yes. in our experience. Yeah. Yeah. People, you know, we went to Rogan's Club in Austin, like the jokes they were making there, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that in the UK, right? So that's fine. I'm but so on, jealous. <laughs> but on this issue, mm. I think they're way behind the UK. I mean, we're known as Turf Island here. Right. Yeah. Have you found that? Is that was it your impression? It's so bad. It's so bad. Um, they will literally slice the breasts off a 13-year-old girl. They will do it. They will do it in Oregon without parents' consent at the age of 15. There are girls at 18 who've had hysterectomies. There's, it's horrifying. There's nullification surgery. The, the, sorry, clarify, what, what is that, Posey? What, nullification surgery? Yeah. That means from, from here... To, to for the listeners, from the chin work. down. Yeah. From the chin down, you get rid of your nipples, you get rid of your belly button, you get rid of any external genitalia, like male or female, and you just have it smoothed except for your pipe work. Like, they literally will, will dehumanise your torso. But why? It's progress, mate. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> because they can. I, I know, I know that's the answer, but I mean, why? What, what, what's, what's the ideology behind it? What, what does that signify? That to me isn't a sex change. That's something completely other. And I think it's like an avatar. I think you become an avatar. I think, yeah. I think transhumanism is a, is a something that sounded too bonkers uh, a few years ago, and I think it's really real that people are trying to uh, get rid of the human from their bodies. Is, is, is that a kind of non-binary thing where you just say, well, I'm neither male nor female, I am this separate category, so therefore I am going to remove everything. Is that what it is? I suspect it is. I mean, non-binary surgeries, especially, well, for girls all the time, they have their breasts removed. I mean, there's such a war on breasts. And they'll just have one scar, like no nipples, just one big fat scar from one side to the other. It's, it's just, when you mix... Um, godlike uh, surgeons with obscene amounts of money and a, a population that, let's face it, it's gone through the opioid crisis. It's not a population that is um, uh, particularly... Um, averse to medical treatment. Thanks so much. I couldn't <laughs> think of the word averse. Um, but they, they, they love it. They, they put their kids in counselling, like at age 10. Mm. Um, they... They are infantile when it comes to parenting. Uh, they're losing so many of their parent rights. It's, I went to a, a rally of a woman that went viral for speaking, <laughs> speaking at a parents' rights, uh, speaking about parents' rights in a school board. 
And you had some... I did stand in front of all these American flags. I looked like I was about to <laughs> announce my presidency. Um, but I went and talked to her. She was great, very religious. Um, but you had her. And then over there, you had teachers just talking about their right to have more money, which I know is important. Teaching is great. But it was just very interesting. They're talking about safeguarding their kids mm. and how they want schools to teach their children properly. And the teachers just going, oh, we would just like some more money. <laughs> it's just, it was interesting. But yeah, the, um, there is something about the American completely, especially the Democrat, who doesn't seem to be very grown up. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't even have a good holiday for their, when they work. It's, it's a very interesting kind of powerless situation where people feel this weird sense of power with guns and... Mm -hmm. Um, free speech and so on. But for me, it felt a lot less powerful as an individual than it does here. Kelly, do you think in many ways it's kind of the dark side of the American dream? I mean, if you can be anything you, that you want to be, I mean, that is the American dream. You go to America, you live in America, you, you have this chance, you have the dream. Yeah. Then surely... Maybe it is. Maybe it says you can be anything, including like something catastrophic like maybe that is the freedom that they've asked for but the trouble is when when it's just the money and it's just kids in medicine like i don't even agree that surgeons should be it, it should be ethically acceptable for surgeons to make women's breasts like skin stretchingly massive um or that you can make someone's ass like so they can't fit in trousers i think those things are quite um, unethical, but it's kids. It's like, and it's so many kids in hospitals up and down the country. They are slicing the breasts off of these girls, and it's um, it's just butchery and barbarism and insanity. The thing that always baffles me about this is it goes against every parental instinct. Literally, the, the, the primary parental instinct that everybody has is protect the kids. I'm going to protect my kids from physical danger. So the fact that they then put them into this system where they become medicalized at such a young age, they get operated upon, non-necessary operations, very serious plastic surgery. Mm. You go, this doesn't make sense. This is a, it's yeah. a kind of lunacy. And these people will have organic food in their cupboard, right? Mm -hmm. And then they'll rush down to do the fifth COVID vaccine. Or they'll uh, put them on puberty blockers. Nothing wrong with COVID vaccines, YouTube. Just make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on. But it, I think it's... I think it's, it, it almost has to be on purpose. This kind of cognitive dissonance. Um, just that there's... I don't know, there's... I don't know how to express it, but there is a feel of, um, I guess it's the coddling of the American mind, right? Mm. There, is a, there is a feel of that in many places. And the people that don't feel like that are called stupid and uh, xenophobic, racist, ignorant Americans. Mm. And everybody else is a little bit on board. Um, so uh, I've got, a cameraman who didn't really know much about it and um <laughs> and he saw blue's clues so blue's clues is a kids cartoon of animals and it's terrible but it's a dog called blue i think and he sort of helps the kids and there was a cartoon of a pride parade for you know preschoolers because that's what we want for our kids <laughs> headed up by a drag queen and on one of the pride parade floats was a child beaver, I don't think this is a mistake, um, with a double mastectomy, it's two scars, four kids. A beaver? A little beaver, like, so uh, there might be pandas and bears and whatever, all the characters in this cartoon. With a mastectomy? Mm. A beaver? Mm. Mm. Why does a beaver need a mastectomy? Because they're a trans kid in the They're a trans parade. beaver. They're <laughs> a trans beaver. Mm. Right. I thought it was an interesting choice of <laughs> character to do that to, yeah. to be honest. Um, but yeah, this trans beaver, and I sort of showed him, he's like, what? 
what? And then about two minutes later, he goes, checked on Snopes, it's real. I was like, I just showed you. <laughs> I just showed you. It's, of course it's real. Like it's, yeah. So they're, they're, they're grooming these kids into this. I don't even know who ultimately benefits or whether it's, like Jennifer Bielek has written an, an, a very um, well-researched article about where the money's coming from and who makes it. Well, there's money in, in doing the surgeries and giving the drugs and everything. And then there's ideology. And then there'll also be parents who, you know, Francis talks about how well this goes against every instinct, but I think the hammer they clobber them with, well, if you don't do this, your kid's gonna commit suicide, I think. That, and that's how they get you. Yes. And actually, even if you know that isn't true. Your friends might not talk to you anymore. Yeah. The school might not talk, uh, might do it uh, behind your back and change your kids' pronouns. Um, the counsellors, doctors, everyone, everywhere you look for help, they basically tell you you're wrong. And so, and you can even get your kids taken away. Yeah. And are you pleased with, therefore, with the progress, relatively speaking, that we're making in the UK? You know, the changes to the Gender Recognition Act, the shutting down of the Tavistock, and the fact that people are suing them for malpractice and so on. Yeah. Uh, we've had a few wins in the UK on this issue. Yeah, I'm happy to say that I've had a little bit to do with some of them. Um, uh, the Tavistock, uh, we put some people in the House of Lords who then started working um, with other people. Uh, that's about as much as I can say. Um, so yeah, there's there's some significant momentum, but that's because we didn't let it go that far to begin with. And that's because you had women on all different sides of the political aisle um, who are willing to speak up. Obviously the women on the left aren't willing to work with anyone else, but they are still willing to speak. Um, so, Kelly, yeah. on that point, actually, since I am playing bad cop again, Go on. Uh, I mean, one of the things that happened during your US trip is quite a lot of left-wing women uh, who would agree with you, I think, on some of the issue, underlying issues, uh, were critical of you for, uh, they were suggesting that you were associating with the wrong people and they didn't yeah. even mean us, they, 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 <laughs> people worse than us. Mm -hmm. um, so there was some suggestion that there were proud boys at your yeah. events and all of this. What say you to that? Well, I was relatively proud myself. It was great. <laughs> proud girl. Uh, yeah. Um, I think there was an ex-proud boy at one or two of the events, but it's a free speech event. Right. <laughs> Anyone is invited. Um, the trouble is that what they want is they basically want me to take the knee. They want me to disavow people. They want me to comment on what women say. Um, and I'm just not doing it. I'm not going to disavow them. Uh, it's none of my business. They're not anything to do with me. I'm not associated with them. It's a free speech event. I'm not going to start playing the disavow, disassociate nonsense game. Because then what happens is... What if I don't disavow someone? Then I'm immediately assumed to have a, a proper association. So I'm just not going to do it. They can basically whistle for it, which they have been for about four years. The most merciless, relentless, vile, consistent attacks have been from women on the left. It's just... I just feel like going, just get a hobby, love. <laughs> like, just... If you want to make me irrelevant, and you want to make people stop listening to me, do something better. Mm. I dare you. Because then I, I become nothing. But they know, <laughs> I think they know that can't be done. Um, and that makes me probably sound as arrogant as they loathe me for, because I've worked very hard to make sure that what I offer with my events is a genuine space for any woman to speak, and men, but mostly women. And I don't think that there's anything more powerful than people just being able to scream into the ether about the, like, insane amount of silence they've had to endure because they can't speak. And what do you mean but that they can't speak? Where can't they speak? At their jobs, sometimes in their own homes. I met women in America who said, how do your kids get on with it? I can't, I can't talk about this in front of my daughter. Like, I'm, I'm really worried. She knows I'm here. I was like, how old is she? She's like 14. I was like, you're scared of your 14-year-old daughter? I met loads of women like that. It's not unusual. And in this country. I mean, 
teenagers can be vicious. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that part of the problem, what you've just said right there? Yeah. Is that people are intimidated by their children. Yes. Mm, and, that is, and that is a real part of the problem, whereby essentially a child can railroad an adult into making a disastrous decision that is going to negatively impact them both emotionally, psychologically, biologically for the rest of their life. Uh, 100 I couldn't agree with you more. It's, um, I sort of figure my role as a parent um, is to raise my children to the, a place in adulthood where they can live on their own. And when they're little, you think, I never want them to move out. But when they're teenagers, you think, I, I'm, I love you very much. But it's, uh, you're really building up to be um, someone who should leave. Um, <laughs> But, and, and you want that for them because life is amazing uh, when it's your life and, and you make your decisions. So that's my job as their parent. I don't care if they like me. I don't care if they like me at all. I don't, I don't need them to think that I'm anything other than someone who will be there when they need it and will not take any crap. Um, you know, and, and loves them, properly loved, like uh, any parent I know would... We die for our kids. So, and everything I do, I see through the lens of how I love my children. Like that's, that's my whole, that's everything that I do. But frightened of them? No, not in a second, no. And, and the other part of the problem, and I'd be interested to get your opinion on this, is isn't it also as well, and you, I used to see it with teachers all the time, they want to be their kids' friends. Yeah. And you're like, they ain't your mate. I know, one of my teachers asked me out for a drink. <laughs> I think it was probably something else. Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's friendship he was after. Yeah. I was about 17, he was yeah. like, why don't you come to the pub? I was like, ooh, no. Um, yes, uh, well, yeah. I think teachers, maybe if you're in the profession too long and that's the only thing that you've done, maybe you forget that you're 20 years older or even 10 or the adult in the room. But I also, I mean, parents as well. Parents who want to be friends with their kids, you, they dress up like the exact same way and then they go out together on a night out. And you think, isn't that part of the problem as well? That nobody wants to be the adult in the room because yeah. being the adult is unpopular because you have to make difficult decisions. Well, and, and when you say I'm parents, present. when you say parents, I think you're being very kind because I think it's mothers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's how I think are more likely want to be mates. I think dads can be irresponsible children with their children and often want to be fun. But I think it's, I think it's mothers more than fathers who are going along with this stuff and don't want to be disliked. And I'm telling you, there's pretty much nothing you can do as a mother if you've got a teenage, <laughs> teenagers to make them like you. I think the more you try, the more it fails. And those kids need those boundaries. We feel safe with boundaries. <laughs> my daughter, if I say to my daughter, when you're rude to me, it really doesn't make me feel very nice. Very nice. She'll go, oh, it's all about you, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm like, in so many ways, I respect that. <laughs> <laughs> so Kelly, uh, coming back to this idea of disavow, it's, it's always interesting to me because I always do feel the... <sighs> I, I cringe when people associate themselves with me or with our brand or what we're doing, who I don't like and whose views I think are abhorrent, for example. And I, I have been quite careful about making that clear to, to my detriment. It means I've not got relationships with people or I've pissed people off or whatever. And I was, I, I've, I, to me, that trade-off is worth it. Why are you um, adamant that you you don't want to say, or at least say, well, look, you've said this thing, that's your free speech, but actually, I, you know, I don't agree with you and I'd, I'd rather you weren't here. Because if somebody stood up on my platform and said something mm -hmm. that I didn't agree with, yeah. then I'm at that moment, I might do it. Okay. Um, if somebody says something who's been on my platform as a free speech thing, and then they say something else, I don't want to undermine everything they've said. I don't, a, I probably don't want to draw attention to it. I don't see how that is valuable for the message that we're trying to get out. Um, but I just, I won't stand against these women who have decided that they are going to speak up because there's so many that don't. And maybe they're perfect women, but they ain't standing up and speaking. So they're not 
moving this forward to a point where our children are safe and women are safe in, in their own spaces. But also, I ain't dancing to anybody's tune. I, I, I just won't do it. And the more somebody demands that I do it, I'm just not doing it. I just think, who are you to tell me that I should do this? Oh, she hasn't done this. If she could just stand up and disavow this person and... Or if I, can just take, if I can just take that one comment that that woman made on your live stream and I can flip it up and I can take it out of context and make you look really bad, will you disavow it? No, I won't. No, it's not going to happen. It's interesting because that was what a lot of people were demanding from us when we had Sam Harris on. You know, go out and slam him for saying the stuff <laughs> that... I mean, we didn't agree with it and it was quite clear from the interview. Why do we have to then go out and, you know, go, yeah, yeah, Sam's an idiot. I mean, we did an interview, make up your well, own do we, mind. Do we want people to speak or not? Yeah. Mm. And, and if we do, do, do we then want to chastise them for everything they've ever said? I mean, I just get it all the time. Um, there are some women that are rabidly obsessed with me. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, but I mean, it's quite it's entertaining. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, there's plenty of men. Um, <laughs> But, you know, just really obsessively weird. There was, there, was, um, there was a woman on Mum's Net, and it's been said elsewhere, that I went to an elite boarding school in Hong Kong, paid for by my grandparents, where I met my husband who was married and stole him from his wife. None of that is true. Um, just, just really bonkers stuff said about me. Um, and it's by the same people that start these rumour mills. Like... Let's say we did have a Pride Boy. So what? How do I know what I know about Pride Boys is even true? How do I know, how do I know anything is true? According to um, even the New York Times, I'm a racist, a bigot, David Duke fan. Um, I've, I've married Richard Spencer in another life. You know, just all these things are said about me and I know they're not true. How on earth could I possibly rely on information about other people? Um, I'm just, and I'm not going to fall into that. And let's say all of those things were true and that pride boy came to that thing and listened to me speak. What harm is that to me? Let's say he's got a daughter who comes home and, at 13 and says she's trans. Maybe the, the, all the goodness in that exchange comes from me into him and his life is better for it. I'm not changed because he's heard me speak. Hey Francis, if you were a member of the public, would you like the opportunity to ask incredible guests like Bill Burr, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, Adam Carolla, Brett Weinstein, John Barnes, Douglas Murray, Nigel Farage and Lionel Shriver your own questions? You bet I would. And what do you think the best way to do that would be? Uh, probably stalking, mate. You'd have to corner them in the supermarket, probably run near like the sort of frozen food aisles, and then just bark questions at them before they, they can escape. Uh, not the American ones, as they have guns. And you'd have to be extra careful with the females, as that's how I got in trouble last time. Do you really imagine you're gonna get Douglas Murray near the frozen food aisle? If you want to ask our incredible guest questions and have access to phenomenal behind the scenes content, then you have to be on our locals. That's right, for only $7 a month, you get incredible extra content behind the scenes footage, giveaways, and also the chance to be part of an incredible community where you can meet and hang out with like-minded people. You get access to our American vlogs as we travel across the country interviewing our heroes. An extra 20 minutes of our viral Sam Harris episode as he discusses his approach to COVID. We're also going to start doing giveaways of exclusive trigonometry merchandise like this, a poster from our Edinburgh show signed by both of us. And also a House of Lords teddy, which you can only get in the House of Lords, signed by the one and only Baroness Fox. Locals also gives you access to an incredible online community. You can share memes, talk about the latest episode, or even make a new friend. Well, just one. Exactly, more than both of us have really. People are now doing meetups in their city because they love locals. In fact, some people enjoy it so much, they prefer it over the show. They prefer locals to trigonometry. If I have to get them executed, I'm the one that goes to jail. Right, go to trigonometry.locals.com. Only $7 a month for all that incredible content. 
trigonometry.locals.com. See you there, guys. Kelly, let's look at it broader societally. What do you think this craze says about us as a society, about the Western world, the way that we live? Well, I, I don't want to say it, but maybe we need a war. <laughs> um, maybe we've Be just got... What you wish yeah. For. Well, maybe we've got too much. Maybe we've... Um, there's a part of me that thinks the collective kind of uh, forward uh, belief of religion and faith and community. Maybe it means the void is filled by something. Maybe we are human... The fact that there are so many religions and creation stories in every single part of the world tells me that it is a human necessity to create answers that we don't know the um, uh, that we we don't know the answers to answers answers to the questions. To answer questions, yeah. That Thanks we don't so know much. To, yeah. I'm very tired. Sorry, <laughs> I feel like I'm overhelping. No, 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 it's great. No. Um, I'll take that help. Uh, but maybe that's what we need in order to function. And we've had collective belief before, so there's, there's something in that. Well, those things are disappearing. I mean, I'm wondering if at the end of all of this chaos will come Islam. Uh, I'm wondering if that will be a prescriptive religion, that people will be looking for something really tight on boundaries because we've lost them. Um, so I think that's one thread of it. And the other is luxury, because if you're not worried, you know, a guy doing scaffolding let's say, he's not worried about, you know, in his moments of like climbing up and screwing stuff and whatever, he's not worried about how he identifies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I don't know, maybe, maybe people feel like they need some sort of civil rights movement to be validated. But like Jordan says, tidy your room. Like sort your own life out rather than displacing what you need to sort out with some bigger picture stuff that isn't even a thing. And uh, one thing that some other people have suggested as maybe a third thing to add, and I'd be curious to hear your opinion about it because I think you're very sound actually on this issue, um, is, I mean, even hormonally speaking, society is becoming less masculine over time, mm -hmm. right? Men's testosterone is going down. Women are much more vocal uh, and present in public life. Now, obviously we don't approve of that, but <laughs> you know, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? Society is becoming more feminized. And you, you can think that's a good thing, or you can think that's a bad thing, or you can be neutral about it, but it is happening. Would you agree? I do worry about uh, men. And, and, and I don't spend a lot of time on that, but yes. Yeah. And some of the this values that drive some of these social movements they are quite obviously stereotypically more feminine than they are masculine when, because they're based on things like empathy and compassion and, you know, all of that, taken to an extreme where they become quite damaging, actually. Um, and I just wonder whether, to some extent, th the fact that we so prize compassion and empathy to, to an extreme that's dangerous is maybe a product of the fact that society is readjusting to a new dynamic between men and women. Um, and, you, you, I mean, you said it yourself, it's mothers that, that mm. often behave in this way, right? Um, are there just too many women around? Yeah, and well, are they talking too much and, you know, um, have they got too much power? I mean, do you see what I'm saying or am I being... I do. I, it's really difficult as a woman knowing how I um, go about this world mm. and being a specific sort of woman. Mm. Um, amazing, legend. <laughs> um, but it's ve it's very difficult to then talk about uh, the impact on men. I think I think a, a big danger factor for men is porn. I think that's a big danger thing for society in general. Uh, let me just get that out of the way. Um, I th think it's very difficult to talk about male violence and accept that most men are not going to beat you up in your own home. Right? Most men are not going to rape you on a night out if they can. Um, and so these themes that we talk about, it's a minority of men. Mm -hmm. um, I've got three sons. I want my sons to be men. And, and I've got a, a very wise person I know is a man called Brian. 
and he talks about masculinity is your sword in your sheath. It's having all the power, knowing that you can use it, but not having to, but it being very, very super aware to everybody that you've got it. Um, that's the masculinity that I'm really attracted to. Um, I'll have a door open for me, actually, every day of the week. Yeah. Uh, and heavy things carried, because I'm five foot one. I offered to carry a bag. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that heavy, though. Um, <laughs> That's why I offered. I was like, oh. Um, it's like, sure. Um, but I do worry. I, I don't know if I think that this particular theme is all about men being emasculated because I think it's it's the height of I don't even like toxic masculinity I think it's mostly bull but I do feel there is an element of real toxic kind of at the peak of masculinity is then like the ultimate woman hating thing you could do is pretend that you are one um yeah I'm just I'm concerned I'm a I'm a, somebody that doesn't cry very much right I'm relatively stoic some some horrible things have happened to me in my life and I'm it doesn't break me at all. If I, <laughs> I think I've mentioned this before. If I had a husband that broke under I, I wouldn't like that at all. No. But then I'm not going to break. No. I, I get what I'm getting at is um it's a difficult one to discuss and it's difficult for you because you're a woman's rights campaigner. That's mm -hmm. your focus. I guess what I'm saying is, and again, Jordan Peterson mentioned this, is if you think strong men are dangerous, just wait until you see weak men. Oh, I agree with you. You know what I mean? I just mean? don't know what a strong man, it's very, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to describe. What does a strong man look like? I think a strong man takes his responsibilities yes. as a father very seriously. Yes. Um, I think a strong man wants to protect the mother of his children yes. as well as his children, right? And then my role is to protect my children and maybe look after my husband. My role as a wife is to serve him and his role as a husband is to serve me. And that will, of course, make a difference in the way that we do that because I had babies. My role, my re reproductive role is to have the babies. I can't possibly think that something so important wouldn't have an impact on the rest of my personality and life. And I mean even childless women. I think we have um, instinct, which I like to call like legacy memory, which is we, we bring the experience of our ancestors, not in a kind of like come by our spiritual way, but just I believe that if you can have instinct that is informed in your genes and you know how to do it, then why wouldn't you carry anything else from previous generations? Why wouldn't it be sort of in your blood and your bones? So I, I do get you and I, I think you're right. I just, I just wonder if some of the things that we had to change mm -hmm. for women to be considered equal because our society is set up on the structure of success and finance so in order to have autonomy you have to have money but in order to have a baby you have to rely on some, as a woman you have to rely on somebody to provide that money and i've got women who are like i wouldn't uh, like rely on my husband i was like well the state then is that different is the state not the patriarchy if you're saying that your husband is I mean, I'm all up for relying on my husband for cash. Mm. <laughs> it suits me fine. But so we had, to, we had to get through some of the things that genuinely did subjugate women. Yes. We had to get through it and we found these particular solutions and they're not perfect by any stretch. And maybe this is the consequences. Yeah, well, this, is what, this is what I'm getting at, right? Because the the progress, inverted commas, that we've made over the last 60 years, there's been some good things about that. But like, when you start pulling on the sweater, you don't know which lines are gonna come out of it. And it just seems to me that, that you, you, what you're talking about there is, is considered trad nowadays, mm -hmm. which is the idea that a man and woman get together and have children and look after each other in, in different ways. Um, and you know, Louise Perry, I don't know if you've, you're familiar with her I, work. I am. She wrote a lovely article about me in The Spectator. Yeah. She, is that sarcasm? No. No, no, yeah. It was uh, really nice. Yeah. Uh, and her book is, is very good. And I think her book is basically making this point. It's like the sexual revolution had its benefits, but look at this. Not great though. I mean, it, I, don't, I don't know too many women who have a good time on a, in a short relationship.
Quite. Yeah. Quite. But that is now the standard for young women. Yeah, I mean, they're just, they've been, both men and women have yes. been coerced into thinking that there is fulfillment in um, numbers. By the way, you know what a lot of women don't understand, If I think, is that it's not good for men either. No. It's really not. It's really not. It doesn't make men happy. There's, there's a small minority of men who, who are happy with it for a while, and then eventually they have kids and settle down with, with somebody. But for most men, it's not good either. No, I don't think we think about this. I, I mean, I just think about the physiological kind of exchange that happens, yes. if you like. And um, I do feel women are short <laughs> short <laughs> 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 That is beautifully put. But society is telling them that actually this is empowering. It's so nuts though, isn't it? It's, um, yeah, I just, I sort of think maybe I'm just uh, very special, but I, I, and maybe it's I've got a, a, a good, a good strong ego and maybe that's for a multitude of reasons. Um, but I've always been of the opinion that I get to um, be happy. I get to do things that I want. I don't have to fit in with other people. Um, I can trust my instincts and I really do. I have a very heightened sense of um, instinctively like what is right. Now I'm not saying I get it right every mm -hmm. in every single time, but if something doesn't feel right to me, I'll just go with it. I'll just trust that I'm that my my instincts know better than my rational brain. And loads of people don't. There's um Gavin De Beck, I think it is, who does the gift of fear. He'd be a great guest. Mm. Uh, a great guest. And he does this gift of fear where he talks about a lot of uh, nasty kind of people who want to harm you, they will rely on your sort of sense of politeness mm -hmm. to justify to yourself why, oh, it's all right if I let him follow me in through the, you know, the, the shared door at the bottom of the entrance. Oh, I won't ask. Um, so it's, uh, he talks about the gift of fear as something that, you know, you don't see a mouse on a, you don't see a mat go, a mouse, when a cat comes along, think, oh, well, maybe they're friendly. <laughs> you know, they, just, they just trust their instincts, and I think we've lost that somewhat. Sort of ties into your, well, the entire thing of your work, really, which is you're like, this, you know, we could be polite, but actually we need to protect this. Is, is that where you're coming from on it? Yeah, pretty much. Mm. I think um, I talk about this on my channel. Most women you will meet have had an episode, um, an experience in which they're in a toilet or a changing room, female only, and then they hear a man's voice. And it happened to me when I'd, I'd flown back from the States a couple of years ago. And uh, a guy came in, he wasn't speaking English. He went in the toilet next to me, he was really loud. I don't know whether he was talking on the phone or whatever, but I instinctively just did this. And I didn't, and then I'm waiting. And it's quite a long time and I'm just waiting. And then when I do start breathing, I'm like, just trying to breathe quite until that door shuts and he's gone and I can hear his footsteps walking away. You can't, you can't pretend. Nobody can tell me that that changes if that male voice is accompanied with stilettos. It's, it's just not true. Probably makes it worse in some ways. Um what do you think, we don't try to focus on personalities on the show generally, but we have somebody running to be an MP in this country, uh, Eddie Izzard, um, who I think said that we just don't, I can't remember the exact words, but it was something along the lines of it's the 21st century. You just, what was it exactly? Does anyone remember? No, I can't remember what Eddie said. It was something along the lines of we just all need to get, with, not get with the program, but it was language of yeah. that type. Mm. Do, do we need to get with the program? No, I think Eddie needs to stop copying my look. <laughs> Just, um, I'm going to run against him. Mm. So if he, if he runs, I'm going to run yeah. as an independent against him. Yeah. And maybe I'll have prosthetic limbs. Do we need to get with the program? No, I think Eddie Izzard is um, definitely is an AGP. He's talked about it. I, I used to feel quite sorry for him because it, it, he... He does talk about this, so I mean, you might have to fact check it, but he was in a documentary where he talked about his mother dying when he was quite young and he looks for her everywhere. And I do believe that is the, the instigation and the start of this particular fetish. 
Um, but no, it's it's so offensive wearing fake breasts and then calling yourself a woman. It's so offensive. I mean, it's years ago that would just be like a comedy sketch, right? A man wearing fake breasts, and now he's running for parliament and. Bloody Russell Crowe is tweeting about it. Oh, you make a great MP. Yeah, come on then. Let's have that. Let Eddie bring the conversation because the beautiful thing about so many of these narcissistic men is that they have no idea that when they speak, they reveal everything that I can't possibly tell people. But if I just show them Eddie Izzard talking and wearing fake breasts, that tells, that tells people mostly um, all they need to know. I'd be interested to see that uh, <laughs> that debate. Uh, I mean, it would make for great content. <laughs> <laughs> we'll happily have you both on to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, we'd love if, that. If you both stand, we would, and we would be fair to both of you. Yeah, Francis exactly. used to open for Eddie on tour. Yeah. Oh, he was so funny. Brilliant comedian. Just, Brilliant. I was so gutted. One of the one of the greatest comedians this country has ever produced, undeniably. When he talked about himself being a male lesbian, and no, they're not they're not a woman's clothes; they're my clothes, and all that stuff, and like. Like, come on, it's on tape, man. He used like, to call himself an all-action transvestite. I know. I've, I could, I used to, like, I could repeat his stand-up because yeah. I absolutely loved him. And I just think it's like the Douglas Murray analogy that he got, <laughs> the train got in the station and he just crashed all the way through. <laughs> yeah. Just ruined it. You're like, no, I'm just back there. But I, not to talk about him personally because I, I, I wouldn't want to be unfair, but... Often what happens with these men is the AGP element of their fetish just gets overwhelming in the end. And where they could sort of keep a check on it, it, it does become a, a, like a, a huge compulsion. Well, if you both stand, we would love to have you both on for yeah. a, a genuine discussion, not a, a bitch fest or anything, but an actual conversation between two people who clearly feel very differently about it. I wonder if he would, actually, because out of all the people, I wonder if... Because he's intelligent, erudite, I'm sure he could construct. He doesn't shirk a challenge. No. Yeah. He really does. So, oh, Eddie, if you're watching, fair debate, the opportunity is there. Mm. Uh, we can, uh, you can come and talk about it. Um, Kelly Jakin, absolute pleasure to have you back. Um, I, before, before we go to our last question, actually, I suppose the question for me is, what is the end goal of your work? What, are you, what does it look like? Is it a set of laws? Is it public policies? What, what, what do you want? I want no more children to transition. In fact, I would like to, for there to be a prevention on anyone being able to transition uh, without at least three years of intense therapy post-18. So they couldn't transition until they were at least 21. Um, preferably 28, because that's when your brain is fully developed. Um, I want the GRA to be totally scrapped. I don't want any such thing as uh, a man calling himself a woman-in-law or vice versa. Um, I would... I've got quite a list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I would, she came prepared, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would like no more female language used for men at, at all. Like, if you want to do that in your private conversations, that's fine. But no government, um, no school, no government, no NHS, no nothing, no official place in which we erase women's language or replace men, men's language with women's. Um... Aside from that, an, I don't know, a knighthood. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, just, it's just, I want us to return to truth. Um, and not my truth or your truth, just the truth. That's, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. Lady Posey of Turfdom. <laughs> <laughs> and we always finish our interviews with the same question, which is, what's the one thing we're not talking about that we really should be as a society? And we'll do some locals questions in a second as well. Yeah. Sorry, Kelly. Well... I think I said paedophilia last time. I think that still needs to be talked about, but I will introduce the concept of parental rights and parents understanding what their rights are and responsibilities, which are first and foremost to their children and not to be sidetracked by what experts or the state tells you is good for your kids. Mm. It's a very good point. Yeah. Um, we're going to do a few of your questions for locals that you've asked on there that only you will get to see. So join us there. But for now, Kelly J. Keen, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you very soon with another brilliant episode like this one or Raw Show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. 
And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, it's also available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon, guys. I'm a teacher, teenager, she teaches teenagers, and have some trans students, trans as inverted commas. How would you address these girls who are minors if you were in my position?